When bringing up the conversation of Subnautica, it's very often that people focus on the fauna of the world, and that's completely valid. The fauna has been extremely well produced by the creators of Subnautica, and are a key feature to the game. But I don't want to tell you about the many fish that this game has to offer, because those have already been covered enough. No. I want to tell you about a different gem in this game that has been virtually untalked about. The geology. Yes, the terrain you swim across is rich in science and diversity too, and has incredible amounts of depth and detail that I'd like to share with you over this video. This is Subnautica, the Rockumentary. Now before we start, I want to make it clear that the geology of Subnautica is not necessarily realistic to how we'd find them, in terms that all these different landscapes are adjacent to each other, when usually they wouldn't be. Each biome in Subnautica is like its own mini-world, a version of our world on a smaller scale. However, the geology is done extremely accurate to how it is to be found in that environment, so I want to praise the devs for their ability to create such a detailed work with such beautifully representative landscapes to our real world. Now, since Subnautica is so massive, and therefore there is a lot to cover, this series will be broken down into episodes containing a few different biomes each. This video will specifically cover the safe shallows, kelp forest, grassy plains and the dunes, since I think these four link pretty well to each other. I'd also like to clarify that since so far all I have running for me is an A in my A-level geology, I'm not the biggest expert out there, I'm only a first year geology student in my degree. So if I miss anything and you notice, please feel free to tell me, as I would love to learn too. With all that said, let's start where we always start, the safe shallows. The biome of the safe shallows is representative geologically of a lagoon environment, since we have the presence of corals, meaning shallow warm conditions of around 27.5 degrees Celsius. These shallow conditions allow for waves to roll the sand grains back and forth, as seen evidently by the ripple marks in the substrate, so this area is likely made up of oolitic limestones. Oolitic limestones are limestones that consist entirely of ooids, these being grains of sand that got rolled by waves back and forth to form calcite shells, becoming these round spherical balls. Considering planet 4546b used to be emerged, this creates the perfect condition for their formation, because they form best when rolled along a beach. This also, interestingly, tells us that the world of Subnautica we are in must be around 30 degrees north or south of the equator, since this is where the conditions required for their formation usually exist. Interestingly, to further the idea that this was once a beach area, we can also see beach erosive patterns in the limestone, with the cave arch stack stump formations being present, more commonly the cave arches. This means that the safe shallows must have been emergent at least once, to erode it. Of course, given the period of time we're working with on Earth, this would have realistically happened quite a few times, but since we don't know the age of 4546b, we can't say if it's happened more than once. The limestone in this area is also jointed, with the joints forming when planes of weakness in the rock get eroded. This would allow the limestone to be more easily affected by sub-aerial erosive processes, such as freeze-fall weathering, where water enters the joints and freezes, causing them to expand, and chemical weathering, where chemicals in rainwater react with the calcium carbonate in limestone, as well as coastal erosive processes such as hydraulic action, where air is pushed into the joints, causing them to widen, which would have allowed the arches and caves to form quite easily. In terms of the fossil record in this place, whilst none are necessarily observable, it's likely that we'd have crinoid and shell fossils in this area, especially broken ones due to the high energy nature of the environment. They break from being pushed down shelves onto rock and falling, or just by general transport. It'd be hard for fossils of larger organisms such as fish to fossilise here due to the high energy, and at the bottom of the shelves, bioclastic limestones can often form from the accretion of broken fossil sediments, where fossils are cemented together by the mineral calcite. Fish bones may be preserved, but in small amounts and often in a broken grade. It's also worth noting that there seems to be a large hydrothermal vent in this area, but I'll touch on these vents later when I cover this same set of rocks in the dunes. For now, let's move on to the kelp forest. As 
you'll immediately notice when we head into the kelp forest, we have the same geological formations here as we do with the safe shallows, these being caves and arches especially. However, the colour of the limestone in this area is different, as well as the flora that have been able to colonise here. You'll notice mostly a lack of any corals, meaning we've likely moved into a different energy environment, as corals require high wave energy to maintain a constant stream of oxygen to them. Therefore, this is likely not oolitic limestone, as we now have large crevices instead of flat plains for ooids to be rolled on, and instead we're likely looking at a general limestone or a chalk. Due to how rich in algae kelp forests are in real life, I'd reckon this is a type of chalk, as chalks form from the skeletons of dead algae, called coccoliths, then accumulate on top of each other and lithify. This lower energy environment means that there may be a chance of better fossil preservation. Shell fossils are likely to be slightly more whole due to the lower energy, which means less transportation, so less of the fossils being bashed into rocks to break them, and we may even find other life forms. We're unsure how long the stalkers or kelp have been around. However, given that other fish fossils have been found in the game, broken fossils of ancestors to the stalkers could be found. The closest I've managed to relate stalkers to a real-life counterpart is the Cronosaurus, a crocodilian-like plesiosaur. The same would go for the kelp plants, although the ability for plants to survive much longer periods of time generally than animals means that the current kelp in the forest would likely be the same genus or even species as the kelp that we would see in the fossil record here. Whilst erosively the kelp forest is similar to the safe shallows, the caves in the kelp forest seem to have a broader depth to them, meaning the kelp forest has likely been under erosive procedures for a longer duration than the safe shallows was. The kelp forest, notably, also contains no hydrothermal or magmatic activity, which either means that the intrusion that caused the activity in the safe shallows did not reach the kelp forest, is under the surface of the kelp forest and is invisible to us, or that the safe shallows is actually older than the kelp forest and therefore the kelp forest was not around when the intrusion happened. Due to the aforementioned erosive pattern suggesting that the kelp forest is older than the safe shallows, however, I'd reckon it's one of the first two and that there may be magma intrusions running under the kelp forest chalk. However, we have no solid evidence to suggest what is correct out of the options I've provided, and with nothing new to talk about, I'm going to move on to the grassy plains instead. Geologically, the grassy plains start to get a little bit more complex due to multiple layers and features existing. We have shales for part of the grassy plains, as visible from the jelly shroom caves underlying the rest of the deposits, which will be covered in a future volume. For the rest, however, we have sandstones, eroding in what appears to be a gorge-like formation, meaning fluvial processes were involved in the grassy plains. Interestingly, we also have embryo dunes currently being formed here, in this case likely by the shallow current as the embryo dunes do not appear to have undergone any lithification or by previous aeolian processes above land before being submerged at a coastal area, a more likely event in my opinion due to the presence of the larger yellow dunes in the dunes area. The presence of gorges and embryo dunes next to each other is definitely a little weird, considering embryo dunes on this scale likely wouldn't be formed by any fluvial processes associated with the gorge, so this is definitely a point in the rockumentary where I have to say that this can only slide because it's subnautica and isn't representative of a 100% realistic environment. Now of course it could be argued that the presence of a gorge and dunes means we may be in a delta environment, where the mouth of a river meets the sea. But unfortunately I don't think that this is the case, as waterfalls are associated with high energy fluvial environments, which can be found upstream, and deltas are a downstream formation. However, if we were to find a gorge next to embryo dunes in real life, my best guess for the cause of them would be marine transgression, where the sea level rises, combined with erosion. This would bring the upstream sandstones closer to the sea, where the embryo dunes can then be deposited on top. Again, however, this is all very theoretical. The deposits that make up the embryo dunes all appear to be quartzy or calcite, similar to the embryo dunes that we see in dune landscapes, meaning that the nearby sandstone is likely to be orthoquartzite, a sandstone that consists nearly entirely of quartz grains and cement. This can also be seen in the quartz crystals that can be found on top of the dunes, which are either from uneroded quartz that is yet to turn into sand, or from quartz that has had space to grow. The dunes are being held together by grasses, the pioneer species in this ecosystem, a species that holds the first dunes together to allow for their formation and growth. 
As for the odd stacks that we have going on, these resemble ventifacts that we see in the real world. Ventifacts are beds of sandstone that were eroded by the wind, sometimes creating these weird stack-like shapes that can often resemble mushrooms. This happens when grains that the wind is carrying, such as sand grains, scrape away at the edge of the rock, abrading it. This isn't something that would commonly happen in an ocean dune or fluvial environment, but once again, this is a fictional world, so we can let it slide. Fossil-wise, the sandstones are likely to be coarse-grained, meaning that they won't preserve fossils very well, as this means that they are from high-energy environments and cannot get the fine details of a fossil. The only fossils you'll be likely to see here are bioturbation fossils, caused from burrowing organisms. They look like little tunnels in the sediment and were likely formed by shelly organisms that live in river or coastal areas. However, the underlying shale from the jelly shroom caves is likely to be fossil rich. Shale is a low energy rock, meaning it's great for creating fossils. Possible whole body fish and eel fossils could be found in these beds, as well as various marine flora. The fungi, however, not really. On a microscopic level, we'd be able to get fungal microfossils, but the actual jelly shrooms themselves likely won't have been preserved, as they are fully soft-bodied and have no preservable hard parts. Of course, this doesn't mean that the jelly shrooms are unpreservable. As seen in the Burgess Shale, the most famous example of exceptional preservation, fully soft-bodied organisms can be preserved. This requires a very specific set of conditions, such as low energy and very fine grains. The most important one to consider here is anoxic, as this means bacteria and other living organisms will not eat any soft parts. However, as we can see with the presence of life in these caves, there is oxygen, meaning the underlying shales will not contain jelly shroom fossils. I'll go more into detail on these caves in another part, and the preservability of each of the organisms. However, now I'm going to move on to our final biome for this video, the dunes. Now, as a pre-warning to this section, the geology in this place is going to get very, very theoretical very fast, so please don't take my word as gospel. I'm also going to ignore any potential lore a little here, because I want to establish a more realistic possibility as opposed to the one that we have canonically. So, whilst I will mention the canon geology, I also want to give my own interpretation which fits the look better. To start off with the more established geology here, we have lots and lots of ortho quartzite. These massive dunes are an especially Aeolian feature, most commonly found either in deserts or on dune succession landscapes. The presence of many small grasses tells me it's more likely to be a coastal dune environment, as the colour of the dunes are more commonly associated with coastal dunes. Desert dunes often contain hematites that give them an orange appearance. Any lithified sandstones in these dunes will contain cross-bedding, a feature that is created from the movements of dunes that creates concave sea-like shapes in the sandstone beds. The grasses being present also tells us that succession is underway, and as they are different from the pioneer red species seen in the grassy plains, they may be colonial species instead, these being the grass species that take over a pioneer species. But if you think that these dunes are more representative of a desert environment and have a good argument as to why, I'm willing to hear your opinions on this. There's also underlying oolitic limestones here from the safe shallows, as seen by the limestone arches containing corals that could be spotted across the dunes, meaning this is likely a continuation of the rock beds that the safe shallows are situated on, but with quartz grains deposited on top. Whether or not these corals are thriving in this environment though, I don't think they are. This area doesn't meet any of the required conditions for coral survival, so it's safe to assume these things are long gone. Sorry, coral lovers. The presence of hydrothermal vents in this area also tells us that there's a nearby source of magma, meaning igneous rocks will be part of the dunes to trigger free. Hydrothermal vents are created when seawater percolates through gaps in the rock, such as the aforementioned joints in the safe shallows limestone, and into a magma body, as seen in other areas of the game. This magma then heats up the water, causing it to rise and form these vents as it does so. When the water enters the magma body, important minerals such as iron sulphide are absorbed into the water and are carried out, creating the forbidden soup. These minerals are incredibly important for the local ecosystem and tell us that the world of planet 4546b must be on a subduction zone or a divergent plate, with a nearby trench suggesting it is more likely to be a subduction zone. There's also these weird features. My best guess is them being inactive hydrothermal vents, but since they appear to be made out of the same safe shallow as limestone, 
I'm honestly stuck, so I'm just going to move on. Now, there's one final piece of important geology in this area that would leave most Subnautica fans unfazed, but when I first saw it, I was honestly stuck. And I still am. This crater, described by everyone except me as a meteorite crater. Now, if this was to theoretically be a meteorite crater, which it likely is in canon, then the big lump in the middle would be our meteorite, and the surrounding rock would be some kind of impact fracture, a conglomerate-like rock composed of angular clasts of other rocks that get ripped up and broken during a meteorite impact that are then cemented together by other minerals such as mud. But if you consider how big this meteorite is, this thing would likely produce a crater that would devastate the whole environment around it. So I'd like to propose a new theory. That the floating island used to be over the dunes. Hear me out on this one. It's obvious that the boulder fell from somewhere, but not somewhere as high enough as space, and this clearly isn't made out of the material from a meteorite. As close as it is to looking like one, with its slightly reddish hue maybe suggesting it has hematite, iron meteorites often have a much brighter sheen to them, and are obviously smaller. So instead, my proposition is that this rock originally was on the floating island, and that it fell off onto the dunes, and the floating island migrated over to the Grand Reef. This would explain why the crater is so small, and the appearance of the rock can be explained by lots of weathering, which can often give rocks a reddish hue and smoothen them out. But it doesn't explain the rock around it, so let me propose something for that too. Since this is a magmatically active area, these rocks could be some kind of volcanic plastic rocks, such as a tuff, made out of igneous materials that were expelled from previous volcanoes or fissures, or eroded from other volcanic rocks. Yes, I know it's not the best theory I have, but if we think realistically about what this rock could be, a kind of volcanic rock is the best guess. These volcanics would have lithified from the pressure of the water and other sediment above it, or simply by time. With the nearby hydrothermal vents and trenches, volcanic rocks have to have existed somewhere. With us having established that we're on a subducting plate boundary, it's also likely that there may be an off-the-map volcano that could have deposited these during an eruption as well. Of course, I may not be right here, and I'm really up to hearing your interpretations of this rock too. And with that, I'd like to thank you so much for watching the first installation in the Subnautica Geology series. I can't promise the uploads for the series will be regular, but I do really hope to eventually cover the whole of Subnautica's geology, since I think the devs did remarkably well with accurately presenting the geology from each biome they've created, even with the small, hard-to-explain details. Make sure to subscribe to see more geology content, not just Subnautica. I cover real-life places too. Stay happy, stay safe, and eat your five rocks a day for their good mineral contents. Music